Good evening and welcome to Eating for the Planet. This event is presented by the UNSW Centre for Ideas and supported by UNSW Medicine. Tonight's event is also part of UNSW's event series for National Science Week. I'd like to acknowledge that we're uh, having this meeting here, this session here tonight from the land of the Bejigal people, uh, the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to their elders past and present and also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us tonight. Tonight we'll be hearing from the CEO of Vic Health, Dr. Sandro DeMeo, as he discusses the planetary diet, our current eating patterns and what we need to change. We'll then be joined by uh, a panel of experts to delve further into these topics. We'll also have some time towards the end of the event to take some questions from the audience and have the panel address them. If you'd like to ask some questions, you can comment either on Facebook by using the live chat on YouTube or posting on Twitter using the hashtag UNSWIdeas. So let's start by introducing um, Dr. Sandro DeMeo, who's a medical doctor, and perhaps that's the, most, the least impressive part of his uh, qualifications, to be honest. He's a pub public health expert and advocate, and has previously worked at the, w at the World Health Organization as the CEO of the EAT Foundation, and he co-founded the NCD Free Global Social Movement. He's also an author, having authored a doctor's diet cookbook, and he co-hosts Ask the Doctor on ABC. His current role is as the CEO of Vic Health, and perhaps at least as importantly, he's an incredibly nice guy. Welcome, Sandro, and we look, look forward to hearing your presentation tonight. Thanks very much, Plato. Uh, and I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on tonight here in Melbourne, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and emerging. Thanks very much for having me. Um, what a huge topic, what an important topic, and it couldn't be at a more important time um, and what we're really talking about tonight is not just eating for the planet, but eating for all people and the planet and the future of both. If we look across uh, where we sit currently around the world, you know, there's an unfolding ecological disaster. And while our minds might have been for a moment taken off uh, this uh, from where we were in January, a stark contrast of focus for societies in Australia and indeed around the world, uh, unfortunately, these ecological disasters continue to occur. Uh, ozone depletion, uh, rising dead zones in our oceans, rising CO2 emissions, uh, rising uh, sea and, and land uh, temperatures, deforestation, freshwater depletion, the list goes on, bio biodiversity and biomass loss. But even just in the last few weeks and months, uh, the story has got uh, even more concerning. We're seeing Arctic blazes uh, in areas, we're seeing bushfires in areas that, you know, pre previously we would never have thought, the Arctic, Arctic tundra, uh, and indeed rainforest even here in Australia. 2020 is likely to be the warmest year on record. You know, it, it would be a Groundhog Day type experience if it wasn't so frightening for the future of our entire planet and everyone who lives on it. And of course, the, the devastating scenes uh, from here in Victoria and across the border uh, in New South Wales back at the start of the year, which still are in the minds and the lives and have a, have a devastating legacy for many in our community. But of course, there's an ecological health disaster unfolding as well. Two billion people, 2.1 in fact, continue to uh, be overweight or obese. 600 million uh, are, are obese. Uh, and yet one in five children, one in five children across the planet on a world that has never aggregated at the aggregate level been richer uh, continue to be permanently stunted for life, lifelong, because of a lack of nutrition, a lack of optimal nutrition in the first five years. We have our global targets, 2015. We set them as a planet, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, including goal two of zero hunger, which was not just about zero hunger, but it was actually about eliminating malnutrition in all its forms. And sadly, the latest State of the World's Children's Report made it very clear last year we're not on track. Uh, we're not on track to meet our targets for stunting. We're not on track to, to meet our targets for overweight and obesity. We are, in fact, failing millions, hundreds of millions of young people around the world and continuing to do so year on year. But the world faces an even more complex picture when it comes to malnutrition. I was 
uh, co-lead of the Lancet series on the double burden of malnutrition and a contributor to the UNICEF Save the World's Children's Report last year, both of which really focused in on this concept that many countries, many communities, many individuals are now facing multiple burdens of malnutrition simultaneously. It's a much more complex uh, crossover and interweb of malnutrition that's unfolding uh, around the world. Gone are the days of the single, single, simple and linear nutrition transition. We now see this much more complex overlap and the coexistence of 30% of stunting and yet 35% of overweight and obesity in adult women in Indonesia, just north of us, 300 million people living on an archipelago. And we know that food is also critical to the wider SDG agenda. We don't have time tonight, but it's, it's inextricably linked to every single uh, almost every single SDG, and I would say probably the last few are just because I didn't have time to think it through before I presented tonight. But, you know, poverty, uh, zero hunger, uh, good food and health, food, you know, food, good, sorry, good health and well-being. Food is a the leading contributor to global burden of disease. We know that education and educational attainment and opportunity and performance are so inextricably linked to nutrition. We know women are the last to eat and the first not to eat gender equality. We know that food and the food systems actually use 70% of global fresh water, uh, SDG 6. We know that consumption and production is going to have to shift. We know that sustainable cities are going to have to change the way they produce, consume and waste food all the way through to partnerships. Goal number 16, uh, goal number 17 is going to be core to solving this issue. So we, we, we look forward to 2050 and tonight we think about, you know, how do we feed 9.6 billion people within planetary boundaries, leaving no one behind, the SDG agenda. Well, where we are in 2020 is a long, long way from this goal. In 2020, a third of global food is wasted. In fact, it's estimated that if food waste alone was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitting nation after China and the US. That is a scale the scale of the food we waste and the scale at which it produces carbon emissions uh, and, and needlessly produces carbon emissions as a result. Environmentally, 20 to 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions come from food production globally. 30 percent of fresh, 70 percent of fresh water use is a major driver of extinction and a major threat to our global oceans. And we've already talked about the health consequences of global malnutrition unabated and in fact accelerating. But what's starting to emerge is some of these really concerning feedback loops like we're seeing with regards to climate. So we know that global hunger is again on the rise, but it's actually on a rise due to climate change and conflict. Climate change, which, for which the single biggest contributing sector is, the, is food production, and conflict, which is closely associated, particularly over the last few decades, with food prices. So food in itself, the way we are consuming in some parts of the world, is growing hunger across the entire planet. At the same time, we know that, it, you know, we talked about food waste and the enormous environmental toll it has on the planet. Second feedback loop. The third, 70% of global antibiotics are used in food. So while antimicrobial resistance looms large, a, a, ma a seemingly major global health threat before COVID came along and continuing to be so, yet another food related feedback loop is looming that threats global security and global health. And finally, food loss itself is a major barrier to income and, of course, therefore, to sustainable uh, economic development and, and drives and entrenches poverty. And then finally, all of this on top of COVID, which has fundamentally changed every aspect of our global food system, from the way we trade food, from the way we price food, from who can pick uh, food and, and the, the freedom of trade uh, the freedom of movement to allow us to be able to, um, you know, harvest food efficiently all the way through to how we access it, how we cook it, how we use it in our homes, how we waste uh, food. Everything has shifted because of COVID and will influence the path to 2050. So the big question really is, you know, can we feed 9.6 billion people within planetary boundaries and still have a planet to hand on to future generations while uh, really leaving no one behind the fundamentals of the SDG agenda? And the answer is yes, but. And rather than taking you through the findings of the Lancet Commission, 37th of the world's leading scientists over two years, I'm going to leave it to a group of German animation uh, experts to explain the story in 90 seconds. 
You know the saying, you are what you eat. But the way we currently eat is in fact ruining our health, the health of others and that of the planet. Unhealthy food is now deadlier than alcohol, drug and tobacco use combined. 2.1 billion people are overweight, yet we eat more sugar, fat and red meat than ever. Still, 821 million go to bed hungry every night. On top of that, our food is the main cause behind species extinction and a third of all global greenhouse gas emissions. So, can we feed a growing population without destroying the planet and ourselves? Science had no clear answer to this question. That's why EAT gathered 37 of the world's best scientists to determine what a healthy and sustainable diet is and how to get there. The result is the EAT Lancet Commission, a scientific blueprint for a healthy and sustainable future. If we change the way we produce, consume, transport and waste food, we can feed everyone a healthy diet while improving the health of our planet. What does this look like? Meat can stay on our plate, but plants need to be the new main course. We should eat a huge variety of fruits and vegetables and a low amount of meat, dairy and seafood. We should choose unsaturated fats and stay away from refined grains, highly processed foods and added sugars. And we have no food to waste. It will take huge changes, but following this plan will lower our risk of cancer, strokes and diabetes. It could help avoid 11 million adult deaths per year. In fact, consuming and producing food more efficiently and mindfully will help to keep our planet flourishing. We have an answer now. We know the right course for a better future. It's on us to actually take that step. Our food can be the key to solving the biggest challenges we face. Food really can fix it. So I'll just take you through how the Eat Lancet Commission, the process of it, because there's a lot of confusion uh, that sits around it and a few myths that we need to debunk. Again, I was not one of the one of the 37 scientists, but uh, I was uh, very closely involved in the commission and its launch. So the first step was that they, together with a group of uh, scientists, including representatives uh, from the head of nutrition from the World Health Organization uh, and some of the experts from uh, various institutions around the world, they defined what was a healthy reference diet based on the best available evidence. So the first point was what does what does a body, a human body need to be healthy? That was the starting point. Then they extrapolated that by 10 billion people. The second was then, okay, what can the planet actually entertain? You know, what, how much nitrogen, how much water, how much phosphorus, uh, how much of the extinction rate, how much of our greenhouse gas emissions within our Paris Agreement restrictions could be given to food production and the food production sector? So you then have these two hard endpoints. What, what do we need to produce to be able to feed 10 billion people and allow them to enjoy good, a good life a long way from where we are today uh, on a deeply divided planet? And then what can a planet entertain to be able to allow it to continue to prosper well beyond our current and future generations? The third was then to apply all sorts of modelling, uh, systems modelling to try and understand you know, what would be the, the, the pathways, what are the trade-offs, what would allow us to get within these two hard, hard endpoints, and finally then outline key strategies uh, that would get us from where we are today to 2050. So there were some pieces, some, some critical pieces missing from, uh, from that. Oh, sorry. And three, three critical pathways emerged, but five transformation opportunities. So the first was driving technological innovation for efficiency and equity. This was really about looking at the yield gaps around the world, the understanding that there will be different environments where food is uh, more or less appropriate to be produced. We live in a globalized interdependent world. Uh, our food systems are going to need to be, in fact, more globalized in 2050 than they are today, we'll need to produce food where it can be produced most efficiently. Uh, and we will need to try and work to close uh, the yield gaps, the differences between what we can produce on certain soils in one environment versus another around the world. The second was to try and reorient agricultural priorities 
you know, away from simply more calories and production, a very 20th century uh, paradigm to more around an understanding of people and planet. The third was around halving food loss and waste already outlined in the SDGs. The fourth was strong and coordinated gov governance of land and ocean. And fundamentally, the, the really tough one, shifting the world to healthier but also tasty diets. So it was controversial, it continues to be controversial, but this is what the Lancet uh, diet looked like. Half the plate is fruit and vegetables, a large section of whole grains, uh, lots of um, seeds, nuts, um, pulses, legumes, uh, and healthy oils. This is what, importantly, I should say also that that reference diet was about 2,500 calories, which uh, is actually considerably less than uh, many uh, high-income countries consume, uh, countries that are struggling with uh, various uh, effects of, of overconsumption of, of unhealthy foods, uh, but also a dramatic increase for, in fact, many uh, low- and middle-income countries around the world. If we compare the reference diet to North America, this is what you see. So the recommend, recommended uh, planetary health diet would see fairly significant reductions in red meat consumption, starchy vegetables, uh, eggs, poultry, and, um, and uh, dairy, but quite considerable increases, and we would see the same in Australia, very big increases in fruits, vegetables, whole nuts, legumes, um, seeds. We, we've seen the same come out of the, uh, the global burden of disease data uh, you know, since as well. But importantly, if we compare the reference diet to a South Asian diet, we see a very different picture. We actually see that, you know, for, for many people, billions of people on the planet, it would actually be an increase in red meat consumption, an increase uh, in eggs, poultry, dairy. Uh, and these are the countries that continue to suffer from high rates of stunting uh, and high rates of, of undernutrition. And there was a study that was in fact just published a few weeks ago in Nature Food and this really speaks to the concept of equity and not equality on, on our road to Paris with regards to food. Because if planets around the world adopted the planetary health diet, you know, all the left, uh, the, you'd see reductions, dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the change in diets. But in fact, you'd see an increase in greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions from diets in all of the, um, all of those uh, countries on the right that have a um, a, a positive balance. And so the aggregate difference would be, the overall difference as a planet would be a decrease, but there would also be greater equity. You would see, in fact, some countries uh, making way for others to really enter and uh, have an equitable pl uh, place uh, in the food system, and as a result, uh, reducing overall global malnutrition. Now, this all sounds very pie in the sky, but it was only a few weeks after the Eat Lancet Commission launched, I remember, in 2019, last year, it seems like decades ago now, um, in, the concept, um, in the context of COVID, as I call in from Melbourne. Um, but uh, it was only a few weeks after that Health Canada actually released their new dietary guidelines. You know, does, this obviously looks very familiar. Half the plate is fruits and vegetables. A uh, quarter of the plate is protein-based food with, a, with an emphasis on plant-based proteins. Um, still some meat, of course, um, uh, choosing whole grains and then water as the drink of choice. So again, you're seeing that it's starting to actually evolve and become part, part of the mainstream uh, from a, a sort of aspirational 2050 uh, target to really the food on the plate in front of us in, in, in countries around the world. And we've seen others follow. But of course, there's a, there's a wider question here, and it's, you know, there are lots of things that were not covered in the Lancet Commission, the affordability of it, how we, how we actually really allow more of the population to afford these diets. You know, how do we, how do we manage the trade-offs that big parts of the planet, actually, we need them to retain their natural resources. We need them to be delivering ecosystem services to the planet to allow us to offset food production in other parts of the planet but both of those processes, both of those forms of land use need to be remunerated properly and respectfully to be able to reach our Paris agreements, to be able to um, hand on a, a planet to future generations, uh, but also to, to, to feed a global, a global planet, uh, an interdependent planet on a single planet. This was the uh, State of the World's Children's Report, the Innocenti framework that Jess Fanzo and many others 
uh, worked. And I think it really gives a, a great picture of then, you know, it's not just about the diet, it's not just about the environment, you know, the Brazilian guidelines and others that have spoken very strongly to the social and cultural elements. It's not just about ad adapting that diet to all of the different flavors and colors and, and cultures and climates around the world. It's not just about equity and the trade-offs that, you know, some countries need to probably reduce consumption of certain things to allow other countries and to allow our fellow people in other countries to get equitable access to a, a global food system and to enjoy uh, any semblance of the quality of life that we uh, all too often take for granted uh, in high income countries. Uh, but it's also about the wider food system and understanding all of the dynamics around the wider food system, how they interplay across the diet to deliver uh, in, a future, in a future world. Now, of course, the, the, the dietary aspect was also balanced against those um, planetary boundary hard endpoints. So what can the planet actually afford to deliver towards global, uh, global food production? We only have one planet. We only have one, um, you know, one body of water, one body of oxygen. Uh, we can only emit one body of carbon dioxide, everything that comes with an opportunity cost and a trade-off. And so these were the boundaries that were identified for global food production, the question then is how do we use technology, uh, trade, uh, um, you know, other aspects to uh, produce food efficiently, but also equitably uh, within these global planetary boundaries. And I suppose the final piece was really that, you know, it's going to take everything. It's going to take uh, this. This is a graph that shows it's a, it's a table that shows, um, you know, if we were to increase production, if we were to halve food loss and waste, and we were to transform global diets, it's only when we have all three working in unison that we actually get to the levels of biodiversity loss of phosphorus and nitrogen use, of water use, of cropland use, and of greenhouse gas emissions that would really get us anywhere close to Paris and beyond. So as I said, finally, there were some things that weren't covered in the Lancet. There are lots of questions. You know, I think the, the authors were very open and, and scientists since have been very open that this really was about starting a global conversation. It wasn't the end point. It was the really departure point. And there are lots of, 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 of pieces that will need to be answered along the way to make sure that the global food system we have in 2050 is not just one that delivers for the planet, uh, but it's also one that delivers for all people. Uh, it's equitable, it's sustainable, it's healthy, and it's respectable. Uh, and, and, um, and, you know, how, how, what that journey looks like, the timelines, the steps to get there, and, of course, the regional uh, and um, adaptation and, and affordability and equity considerations will be, are, are all the questions that the global, world, the global community is now um, grappling with and, and answering. And I would just say that next year there'll be a United Nations um, a summit in September on food systems hosted by the Secretary General. Uh, the State of the World's Children's Report last year focusing on food systems for the first time ever and only the second time on nutrition. You know, th these are signs that the world is, um, there is a, I think there is a convergence of opportunity at the policy level, at the consumer level, um, you know, at every level, at the pr producer level um, of getting to this uh, more sustainable future. Um, thank you very much. Uh, ...concept for us all to think about and to help us explore that a little bit further now, um, I'd like to introduce the panel that we have with us tonight, starting uh, here in, in uh, Sydney with Dr Jennifer Cohen, who's a clinical dietitian and a research fellow here at UNSW Sydney. She also works as the evaluation manager at Canteen Australia and has a particular focus on uh, children's nutrition, which perhaps is important when we're talking about planetary health in the future. Um, impressively, uh, Jem was recently named as the Australian Dietitian of the Year. So congratulations <laughs> on that, Jem. Uh, next to Jen, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alexandra Jones, who's a senior research fellow at the George Institute for Global Health here in Sydney. She's a lawyer by training and uh, a researcher into food labelling and also the raw role of law and policy and a whole range of other macro factors on food and health more broadly. Welcome, Ali. Um, and last but certainly not least, Damon Gamow, who's uh, joining us remotely and who's an actor and a director 
a star of several films and uh, the director of That Sugar Film, uh, a movie that certainly made quite a splash and has won Best Documentary at the Australian Actor Awards uh, and was followed up by the publication of That Sugar Book, appropriately. He's also now moved more broadly into looking forward to the future and has a new film called 2040 that perhaps we might hear about as the evening moves on. So welcome to all of you. And maybe I'll start us off here in the discussion by um, asking each of you for a perspective on what we've just heard from Sandro, perhaps starting with you, Jen. Um, what do you think the implications of um, the work that Sandro's, Sandro's described are for individuals and families here in Australia? Um, yeah, great question. And thank you for having me. Um, I, exactly like Sandro said, I think this is a great opportunity to start the discussion and um, and that can be discussion at a you know government level at a world level but also individually in your own homes and with your own families and I think what's important and this was already pointed out in the um, in Sandra's presentation that there is still a gap between you know what the recommendations are or what's considered you know a healthier diet versus what we are doing as a, as a you know as Australians and so I think for anyone watching this, it can be sometimes overwhelming when you get given these recommendations of you know 50% of your plate fruit and vegetables and avoid uh, processed foods and a lot of the time you, you know people get stuck on that about where do I make the change because the change has to be so significant. So for me, I think one of the I guess the key messages for anyone listening is you know what is pick somewhere to start. So a bit like we're doing at a global level, which is this is a starting point and let's move forward, is pick somewhere to start. That could be as small as I'm going to try and have um, vegetables at my breakfast for a change rather than the cereal, or I'm going to have one less meal with an ultra processed food, or, you know, pick something, you know, it could be even as simple as if you have two sugars in your coffee, reduced down to one and a half teaspoons. I know they seem small, but it's about making very small gradual changes um, over time. And I think we need to see that individually at a government level and then a global level as well. Yeah, important comments, Jen. So start small and start think small. about it as a journey that doesn't have to be all done at once. Yes, yeah, definitely. Important. Um, Ali, can I ask you, um, what do you think this means for us as a society and how we produce and manage food more broadly? It's also a good question. I think that uh, there's clearly not going to be a silver bullet policy that's going to fix this. I think the great thing about the report is that it sets out some targets and then it, we're on a journey to get there that we need to start now. Um, as Jen said, I, mean, I think education is necessary, um, but it's not going to be sufficient to drive change because you can't really just tell people to eat better and then put them out in an environment where they're surrounded by unhealthy, unsustainable, cheap foods. Um, so a lot of my work focuses at a population level and we look at things like how can we use laws, taxes, subsidies, things that are going to change the environment overall. And we can see that in some countries they're already using this to shift healthy diets. So somewhere like uh, Chile has warning labels on junk foods and that's good for individuals but I think the interesting thing is what it does to companies if it makes them change what they put in foods. And we can already see discussions happening now around things like a meat tax for example um, based off the health um, consequences of processed meats particularly say for cancer. Um, but we could say that a meat tax potentially also has environmental benefits. I think we're going to have to really hone the design of the policy to make sure that we get both objectives right. Um, we don't want a policy that points us to healthy foods that then damage the environment and vice versa. So there's a big task ahead, but I think we know where to start. Okay, great. We might come to uh, Damon in a moment, but I think we have a question um, online from a student um, locally here in Alexandria, and maybe we might hear, hear this question and, and then get you all to respond to that. Hi, my name is Ben and I go to Alexandria Park Community School. My question is, what is the healthiest sugar and why? So Sandro, good sugar. Can you uh, <laughs> give us your perspective on that, please? Do I, I might, as, a, as a doctor, it's always safe to pass to the professionals, to, to our dietitians and nutritionists. But um, look, I, I think uh, you know any sugar that's uh, in fruit and, or a vegetable and uh, intact in the, in the whole form is pretty good. Um, it's nature's way of getting us to eat fruit and vegetables. So, um, you know, probably, probably sticking to the stuff that's uh, naturally found in, 
in the fresh whole whole things that we uh, that we enjoy. Jen, I think that's a great answer. I'll um I'll let you uh, have that good great. answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we're starting to get a few questions coming through. So thanks to the people who are uh, sending questions. Just a reminder, you can send, send us your questions using Facebook um, in the comments, um, through uh, YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag UNSW Ideas. So a question here, um, maybe I'll go to you, Ali, for the next one um, from Melissa on Facebook, which talks about helping people make healthier decisions. Um, at a consumer level. How can we help people to move towards a healthier diet? Well, I think that what I've just said is that it's good to educate consumers, but it's really hard for people right now when they're walking around in an environment um, where everything is set up, whether it's the marketing or what's available in the supermarket is going to point you in the wrong direction. Um, so one, one opportunity I think we have now in Australia is we've just announced a refresh of the Australian Dietary Guidelines. Um, what I would hope um, they end up looking like is something a bit more like the Canadian example that um, Sandro showed on the plate. I think two things about Canada's example are interesting. The first is that Health Canada said that they would not involve the food industry at all in development of the guidelines. And you can see that the end product is a bit different. There's nothing in a packet visually, for example, um, and there's a lot less um, animal products on there. Um, but these things, you know, if we got that in the Australian guidelines, if we looked at sustainability, which would be a new thing, that would be great. But if people really want to be healthier, we still need that to filter down into the policies, into the school food canteen, um, into the way we price foods, and that will make a difference for consumers. Mm. Jen, from a dietitian's perspective, working with people on their diets each day, yeah. how can we help them? Um, I think the, exactly what I said before, which is about encouraging small changes. Um, I think there's a lot of also confusion out there um, and differing opinions of what is you know, a healthy or an unhealthy diet, um, what should people do? And I think um, you know, those, those questions are good, but a lot of the time it's, and it, along those lines actually is what I wanted to say, is that a lot of the time we want to blame individuals for their choices, that we say, well, you know, this is what you need to have, why aren't you making those changes? And I think we need to realise that it, exactly like Alexandra said, it's not, you know, our food, you know, our, the society we live in and the way food is produced, the way food is provided to individuals, I think makes it very hard for, you know, society to make those choices. So I think a lot of the time there is, yes, we need to look at individuals, but it's not about blaming individuals, it's about looking at that sort of food environment, food policy. So we do have a, a long way to go. I think we're gonna give more questions and answers from this. <laughs> and Sandro, you're, um, you've now got a job where you're um, responsible for this area, for Victoria. Mm -hmm. you know, what's, yeah. what's the approach that you think is most appropriate for us to help really move us towards better outcomes going forward? Apart from having uh, Ali on speed dial. <laughs> no, look, I think, um, I mean, Ali summed it up really well. It's, it's, the, uh, it's moving from just uh, advice to understanding that it is, in fact, uh, affordability, it's, accept it's access accessibility, uh, it's lowering um, those, those major hurdles, and that requires uh, policy change. Uh, we need to be looking at things like, um, you know, advertising of unhealthy foods, uh, pricing policies. We need to uh, empower consumers at the point of, of purchase through different labelling options. Um, you know, I think there are the, the, the evidence is very clear. Uh, we don't we don't have a lack of evidence. We we probably just have a lack of political will. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, a lot of these. Um, policies, uh, the, the writing's been on the wall for, for many, many years, um, and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's probably convenient to perpetuate the myth that uh, it's somehow individual, collective, individual responsibility, but, but that's absolutely not true. Um, you know, most, I'm, I'm yet to meet any family who doesn't want to put good food on the table for their kids, uh, but it's being able to afford it, it's being able to have the time to uh, actually make it, it's about um, being able to ex to access it. These are the issues. It's not being bombarded. You know, it's, it's it's not being bombarded 
by advertising, uh, you know, at every corner or passing uh, eight or ten uh, fast food outlets on the way to and from work. These are the types of issues we need to actually overcome and, and, and certainly from our perspective, I mean, the, this is where we're putting our focus as an agency. Thanks, Sandro. Um, we've got a few questions coming through for Damon, just to let people know that we're uh, we've lost our connection to Damon for a moment, but we'll get him on as soon as we can and throw some particularly curly questions to him. So uh, watch out for those. Um, Sandra, a question here about animal agriculture and products and the fact that they're associated with health and environmental issues. Um, you know, should we be recommending that people consume any of them at all? Is that, is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> you get the hard question, Sandra, I'm afraid. First of all, we, we in Australia consume more meat, particularly red meat, than even the dietary guidelines, the current dietary guidelines recommend. So we're already over consuming even based on our national dietary guidelines. Um, the, the second element is that we're talking about a global change. So, you know, this is not going to bring the end of agriculture in Australia. In fact, it's probably going to do the opposite because we produce some of the most efficiently uh, produced um, uh, meat in the world and, and as I said before there are tens or hundreds of millions of people currently locked out of the global food system. It's about us eating a little less in Australia to allow others around the world to enjoy a good life by eating a little more. Um, so you know I don't think that the message from, from the Lancet Commission is that it's safe to be um, vegan if you want to but it's not what they're recommending. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan, um, but it's about being more conscious, it's about eating less, uh, it's about eating higher quality so that the money we do spend we can actually spend uh, on less uh, meat and therefore slightly better quality um, when we do purchase it. Um, and it's about enjoying it when, when we do, but also it's about, you know, ultimately it's about consuming less than we currently do in many high income countries because we only live on one planet. There's only so much land, oil, water, uh, air, um, soil that we can use to produce food for everyone. So if we can see, continue to over consume above what is recommended by the health agencies, above, way above what is recommended by uh, the, the global, uh, global health agencies, we're not only doing ourselves a disservice, but we're also locking millions of people out of the food system. So, you know, I think Australian agriculture has got a very strong place to play in the future of meat uh, and, and in producing the highest quality, most efficient meat. But Australians are probably going to have to give up some of it so that others in the global food system can enjoy a good life like we do. Thanks, Sandra. And maybe, maybe Ali, I'll ask you just to extend that and think about what are the implications for industry in Australia and particularly people working in agriculture if the planet as a whole moves more towards this sort of a diet? Do you have any thoughts? Mm, that's a good question. Um, this is something that, you know, I, I can't pretend to be an expert on the production side. I mean, most of my work is on the shifting towards the healthier diets. But I think where you see these transitions, you can have just transitions. So it's acknowledging that people will be, as we shift our diets, there will be shifts also in the people that make those foods. Um, but there are ways that we can offset that. And we have a history of doing that in policy. If we, if we raise a tax on meat, we could use some of the funds from that to um, transition the people that were growing the meat into another crop. So there are ways that we can do this. I don't think anyone's saying that um, businesses should go bust. It's the same that we're creating a market for renewable energy. We could create a market for healthier, more sustainable food. There would be jobs and opportunities in those new markets too. Certainly no one's going to stop eating. And potentially bigger opportunities for those organisations who embrace yeah. this change going forward. Okay. So um, I think we've got Damon back with us here. Damon, um, <laughs> thanks for joining us. I know we've had some technical challenges, but maybe could I ask you just to comment more broadly on, on the presentation that we heard from Sandro and, and the messages that it contains. Um, given your role as a professional communicator, how do we help get these messages out most effectively um, amongst the broader community? Yeah, so um, I would say that um, What's clear from Sandra's presentation is that agriculture is a 
incredibly deleterious to us right now. And so what that means is it also presents us an opportunity to uh, turn what is a problem into a really powerful solution. And I think uh, some of the research emerging now around uh, the way that certain foods and crops can sequester carbon, uh, how they can impact the water cycle, retain water in our landscapes, uh, then the health benefits to the wider public. I think these things need to be really strategically told. I think even using terms like meat tax is just going to shut down a lot of people. I think we've got to be very smart with how we tell our stories. Uh, even I think the food plays a really powerful role in our climate change story. Uh, I find with 2040 that even people that didn't think climate change was real or weren't interested in climate change were very interested in the soil regeneration story, the impacts that could have on foods and communities and farmers. So I think now more than ever we've got to be smart with how we communicate and get out of this sort of ivory tower notion of using terms that are clever to us like anthropogenics or negative emissions or even Paris target. We've got to actually start communicating at a very human level and talk about what people value, which is their security, it is their health, the future of their children, um, and food is a huge, obviously, an entry point there. So um, I've spent the last five years just looking at a variety of crops and ways that we can farm that will turn these things around. And it's been quite amazing, exciting for me to learn those things, um, especially given that 80% of our global crops uh, are only utilising 4% of the plant family. So there is just hundreds and hundreds of species that we don't even know about yet that have huge nutritional benefits and are able to sequester huge amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. So we really need to pivot and change the way we've talked about our food. Currently, it's incredibly extractive. Uh, we fight nature, we use chemicals, we control it. We really need to work with nature. Stop destroying the soil, stop using excess chemicals, and start to work with farmers. Bring them into the conversation, don't ostracise them, because this is a beautiful opportunity for us to have a really powerful conversation about what we can all achieve together. Thanks, Damon. Important comments there. Um, so we've got some more interesting questions coming through uh, online, and please do keep sending those through. Um, maybe a question for, for you, Jen, to start with. People are asking, um, uh, we've got an interesting question from um, Digby Hall, who asks about um, plant-based meats. Are they, you know, what's their nutritional status? Are they um, a food which could help us move towards these sort of targets in our impossible burgers or whatever else it is that we eat? <laughs> um, uh, that's actually another great question. And I think when we're, you know, that message about um, plant-based eating is definitely a message that's been coming out in the last couple of years. And I know there's an increase in, you know, products we're seeing on supermarket shelf, which are plant-based meats and plant-based meals. And I, I mean, I think it's a great conversation. I think the danger of some of those, and again, that's a strong word, is that we're going still down the line of that, you know, that processed food or the ultra processed food. Um, you know, there is some emerging research showing that food that's ultra processed, now that's different to processed. So mm -hmm. when you hear something that's a food that's processed versus ultra processed, when we talk about ultra processed, there's foods that, you know, we're talking about your biscuits and your cakes, but even things like some of your tin soups and, you know, bottled sauces, they're ultra processed foods. And we know that those potentially have um, risk for our health. So what we're seeing with some of these, I guess, plant-based meals is, are they actually just going down that same line of being an ultra processed food? Now they do have some place in there because there are some you know, products that are potentially a better version of a plant-based meal. But we have to be careful that we don't then go, okay, well, um, we're gonna have this because we consider it healthier because it's plant-based, but the reality is it's just another version of an ultra-processed food, just remodeled something differently. And again, when we're looking at processed foods or ultra-processed foods, you know, there's, there's packaging involved with that. So that's, you know, there's that, that discussion around sustainability is there as well. So I think they have, they potentially has a place, but I think you have to be very, very conscious of what you're buying when you are in the supermarket and don't think just because it's plant-based that that means it, that equals healthy. And I think we've learned that lesson before when there's a new trend that comes in, then you know, food manufacturers tend to then sort of buy into that food trend, make new products, and then we consider it healthy. So there is a place, but I think be very, very careful. Thanks, Jen. So that 
coming back to Damon again, you mentioned you were talking about agriculture before, really more at a commercial level, but there's an interesting question here for you um, about people growing their own food and the role that that might play in, in this whole movement and in helping people to take up healthier diets. Yeah, I think that's been one of the most uh, positive COVID stories was the, um, the panic buy on seeds uh, around Australia. I mean, all the, all the press went to toilet paper, but I think the better story was that people were buying seeds right around the country and started growing their own food. Uh, if you look at the statistics, it's quite interesting that about 78% of our food globally comes from local producers. So Big Ag, who produce the corn and soy and wheat and sugar, they only account for about 20% of the food supply. And a lot of that is going to animals. And as we know, a lot of that is not good for our health. So it's really about shifting those subsidies away from those big ag producers to support local farmers, especially women. There's really interesting research around when women get to control that food, how different it is. And that happens right around the world. So I think that um, you know, here more than ever, we've seen the fragility of our system in this moment. These supply chains just aren't working for us. We've seen about 700,000 pigs being euthanised every week in Iowa because the restaurants closed and saw millions of chickens be put down despite uh, chickens still being brought into the country from other, uh, some overseas. So it's, it's really exposed how inefficient our system is and that we really need to look at this sort of localisation, this resilience that needs to kick in now around our communities, the local production, how can we grow our own food? And certainly from the screenings we've done around the country and the world, it's just such a common thing that comes through from people. They want more sovereignty on their food. They want food in their nature strips. They want a community garden. Like this is a great thing for children. They should be in all our schools. Uh, we should be releasing laws that allow people to grow you know, food through their cities. We're seeing that in some European countries now. They're growing fruit trees in Copenhagen. Uh, Adelaide are looking at a program to grow fruit trees for their homeless people. I mean, we've done it before, like the Victory Gardens in the war. Now is the time to do it. Localised food is better for us, it's better for the planet. Um, and, you know, we should, instead of just planting trees, we should be planting fruit trees and perennial vegetables. Uh, there are so many hundreds of vegetable trees around the world now that just are underutilised. What a wonderful time to actually boost them up so we move away from this sort of monocrops, these rows and rows of just the one food. Let's really look at diversity and growing lots of different foods that we haven't considered before uh, because now's the time to do it. Thanks, Damon. So, Sandra, a question here um, from Rose, moving us from the growing our food to how we sell it and deliver it, I guess, um, and specifically asking about the role of subscription food box services. Do you have a view on those? And are there any examples, perhaps, that might combine a social good aspect to, to the work that they do? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Bardo. Um, it's a great question. But before I before I go to that one, I'd just love to take a step back to the production question. Um, so I think David made some really good points. Uh, you know, smallholder farmers do produce most of the world's food. But having said that, they are most vulnerable. They're dependent on being able to produce the food. The food that they produce feeds their families, it feeds their communities, and it's the economic lifeline that feeds uh, them financially. In the context of climate change, in the context of uh, all of the ecological challenges that are facing the planet, uh, smallholder farmers are going to be the most vulnerable uh, going forward, even in a, dis in a sort of disaggregated or, or disseminated food production system, which you would think would be able to manage shocks uh, better. Um, they, they are facing unique and quite um, you know, extreme challenges. Uh, and I think smallholder farmers, we often think about the food system. Damon made a great point. We often think about the global players, we think about sort of, you know, mo large monocrops, but actually the majority of the world's food, the majority of the, the food's private sector around the world uh, is actually smallholder farmers. It's, it's uh, you know, um, it's small uh, producers uh, across the planet. The other, the other point I would make is that food production, we're talking about food tonight very much in the context of what it does for our bodies, what it does for the planet. But let's not forget that food is so much more than that. Food, food is its connection. It's the, way we, it's the way we interact with each other. It's our fondest memories as children. It's how we bond with those around us. It's so part of our culture. It's so part of you know, Australia's culture for, for hundreds, for tens of thousands of years. Um, and so food, producing food while you know, uh, backyard veggie patches, uh, you know, the evidence may suggest that they're not 
probably going to be able to sustain the future of um, you know large globalized um, urban urbanized uh, populations they still have a really critical function in addition to their food production uh, uh, capabilities they're obviously contributing you know a connection to the soil the biological and and um, uh, immunological benefits that it brings to young people. They're allowing us to reconnect with food, to understand the food system, to understand nature. They have huge mental health benefits, being in the garden, producing food, uh, growing food, connecting with food, cooking food, sharing food. So it's much more than the benefits of just does it make enough food to feed the planet, growing it in your backyard. I think, you know, it needs to be this more nuanced hybrid uh, conversation, looking at the, the many benefits it brings in terms of the second question you asked, it's a pet question, and I promise I didn't pay Vlado to ask this, but absolutely, look at one of the benefits we've seen across, uh, the, you know, the small silver linings that we've seen across the coronavirus period has been this huge surge in um, in uh, boxes, fr fresh food box deliveries. We, while we we actually have really two supply chains in Australia, one is sits with our duopoly, the two big supermarkets, and and that's you know hitting record targets. Uh, the other is the parallel supply chain that goes from the local, the big market, the big fresh food markets, the local markets, our local grocers, restaurants, um, you know, the corner stores. And that, that food chain, that food supply chain is really struggling. So one way that we, we as Vic Health have been trying to really preserve and protect that parallel supply chain of food that is so important to producers, to local small and medium enterprise and to communities across Victoria and across Australia is to support organisations that have been able to uh, pivot the food provision into uh, food boxes and other um, forms reaching particularly um, vulnerable, low-income uh, and marginalised uh, communities and families. One of those is our Community Grocer. Uh, we've recently, we're about to announce some further funding, but we found, funded them about two months ago to scale their work. Uh, and it's a social enterprise uh, that does provide um, fresh food boxes in social housing, uh, in low income uh, communities, uh, and it uses a, a cross subsidy uh, social enterprise approach through uh, fresh food boxes. So, you know, that's, that's innovation that is occurring in the food system in a matter of weeks, responding to the situation. Um, and it shows again, the resilience of our food system. It shows the resilience of small, medium enterprise uh, in our food system, and it shows the resilience of local food systems, as Damon already said. Thank you. So um, also when we're thinking about um, supplying food, a key place that many of our most important citizens, so young, um, get their food is from schools and universities. And there's a question here uh, from Juliana Costa about initiatives in Australia to restrict the availability of unhealthy foods at schools and universities. And maybe Ali, um, if you want to comment on this, are, are our schools and universities doing enough? And sure. what are the so things that work? Every state in Australia would have a school canteen um, guideline. Obviously in Australia, a lot of kids are bringing their food from home. So that's also a lot of responsibility on parents, which you know, can, be, can be stressful if those parents are time poor. It'd be interesting to know how kids are going at home at the moment and whether they're eating better than when they take their lunchbox um, to school. But um, schools are doing a lot and it, it's a challenging environment um, in the school canteen. They don't often have a lot of resources um, to prepare a lot of food there. Some sc schools have great Stephanie um, Alexander kitchen gardens, which like Damon said, is a really great way for kids to get engaged with the garden. Um, here at UNSW, I know we've been working on an initiative to improve the food environment. It seems a bit strange right now because campus is very quiet. Um, but, you know, other universities in the US have, for example, removed sugary drinks. That's, that's uh, soft drink is just something that's not a necessary part of a healthy diet. And it comes in plastic bottles. Um, we've been trying to do that here. It, it's challenging. Um, I would also give a shout out to um, academics, including Cathy Sherry here, who has put a garden into the law faculty. Um, and all students who do the food law course maintain that garden normally. So I don't know how it's looking right now. Um, maybe I should go and check if there's anything to harvest. And Jen, yeah. your thoughts? I was going to add to that is, um, and again, I can really only speak from a New South Wales health perspective because that's what I know. And I'm sure exactly each state has their own policy. But along those lines, um, with the sort of healthy canteen initiative and the universities, is that at a hospital level, 
um, that there's now policies about again removing sugar sweetened uh, beverages from uh, from a hospital. So, you know, you often went into you know even the children's hospitals here in Sydney, and there was vending machines with uh, sugar sweetened um, beverages there. And so there's now policies where they're actually being removed from vending machines and from you know the 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 cafes and the places that are selling those in the, the hospitals. So, and I think there's the same policy for the universities as well and similar for um, schools. So, you know, these are good examples of, you know, initiatives that are coming from, I guess, the government um, to help remove sugar sweetened beverages from, you know, from line of sight for a lot of people to help um, other to help people to make uh, better choices. So there are definitely initiatives out there, but I can't speak to the other states, but I'm assuming they're there as well. Mm -hmm. So we might move to um, back to Damon now and, and get you to perhaps think about a couple of questions here first that I'm going to combine. One is asking about sustainable and alternative food sources that countries could shift towards, excluding insects. And Rose, who obviously doesn't like insects on Twitter, um, hasn't had uh, answered ex at Mexican restaurants. But the other question that I'm going to combine that with is from Luke, who asks about the role of native foods and especially the foods that the Aboriginal population have used to sustain themselves over tens of millennia. Um, do you have any thoughts about things that we should look to grow more of or move towards um, if we're going to move towards this sustainable planetary diet? Yeah, that's a question. question. Um, I've been working with a group actually in Victoria at the moment called Odonata, and they are, are doing some eco corridors where they're fencing off the predators and bringing back some of the native Australian animals, um, uh, quokkas and, uh, sorry, quolls and bettergongs. And it's incredible that these animals are such soil engineers as well. When you let them go, they actually aerate and dig up the soil, um, but also they clear the foliage under the trees. The whole cycle kickstarts again. But there is enormous opportunity, I think, in our country um, to, you know, I was looking at the, uh, the wattle trees the other day and why we don't eat more wattle seeds. You know, they're very high in protein. Uh, they're a nitrogen fixer as well. They sequester huge amounts of carbon. They even ha have D uh, DMT in them if you really want to go there. Um, and then there's the mulga tree as well, uh, which has been used as a sort of a com combines with a, with a wasp to make a certain apple there. Uh, it's a very sustainable wood. We should be using that. It's a perennial which grows back. So I think there's a huge opportunity now, especially as we re rebuild up the fires. We've just seen how many species were lost. Um, now's a chance to be really strategic with what we, we plant there and grow back. If we are going to revegetate some of these landscapes, let's grow pollinators so that we can give habitats for bees and these other insects to come back. I mean, we've got a chance to start again uh, and we don't want to waste this opportunity. And we have such a gift in this country. We're so unique. That's what's beautiful about this planet is that each region has its own specialty. And Australia is blessed with the animals and the, and the, and the plants and the, and the foods we should be eating that the majority of us know nothing about. So I think now is a really great time to bring that conversation in. I know a lot of farmers, uh, since the farmers, have been reaching out to the Indigenous community doing fire ecology training, but also just tree management training and looking at really interesting modes of, of what they can do on their farms, which wouldn't have happened, I don't think, without the farmers, so the fires. So the more that we can promote those conversations, this is a really great opportunity to bring in that Indigenous wisdom and that Indigenous knowledge, which we should have a long time ago. Uh, and I'd urge anyone, I've just finished reading Tyson Yunker Porter's book, uh, Sand Talk, uh, How Indigenous Thinking Can Change the World. And it is a profound read uh, just to see the lens that we've been looking at, especially with agriculture, uh, and Bruce Pascoe's book's the same, to suddenly start looking at this land and our country in a very unique way and how these people survived and the foods they ate for for so many years, now's the time to start introducing that because that's what's suited to our country. That's how we retain the water. That's how we sequester the carbon. That's how we fireproof our country. So uh, it's now or never really. The door's open and it's a great opportunity. Damon, thank you. Sandro, can I ask you um, perhaps for your view on that and maybe also thinking about what role Australia might play in supporting other countries in moving down this path from a, a broader sort of agricultural perspective? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Plato. No, look, I think, uh, I think David, again, made some really good points. Um, you know, the, the simplest, the, you look at the global burden of disease data, you look at the Lancet uh, diet, really it's about increasing our fruit and vegetable consumption. Uh, it's about taking up more of our plate with veggies. Uh, most Australians, almost every Australian doesn't eat anywhere near as 
many vegetables as we should or could. Uh, we're a great producer. We grow the, the freshest, tastiest veggies in the world here in Australia, and um, we export a huge amount of them. Uh, but we, you know, a, a big. I think if you, you know, if you really want to shift your diet to be closer to um, what is good for the planet and good for your body, probably the single simplest thing you can do is take up more of your plate with veggies, uh, and then naturally that will offset, start to offset some of the other things. In terms of the role of, of course, there's more nuance, but you know, uh, single line. Um, in terms of the role of Australia, I mean, I think we've got a huge opportunity as a nation. We, we are a big food production producing nation. We, we've got incredibly fertile uh, soils. Uh, we've got some of the most sustainable and uh, progressive uh, soil, uh, soil management and production methods in the world. We've got great climates uh, for producing everything from, you know, apples in Tasmania up to tropical fruit in northern Australia. Um, so, and, and, and also meat, meat production, you know, there are lots of parts of the world that are not, uh, that are, where it's highly inefficient to produce meat. Uh, it comes at a, at a massive economic and environmental cost, uh, and it makes a lot more sense to produce it where you can produce it. The, the clear message from scientists, uh, including uh, scientists working more in the environmental space is, you know, produce food where it can be produced most efficiently. Uh, let's increase you know, global trade. Trade by oceans uh, on a ship is incredibly efficient, far more efficient than uh, producing it in hot houses locally. Um, and, uh, and, and finally, you know, we have to understand that we live on one planet. So what I eat here in Australia does have an impact on what other people can afford to eat, on the lives that they live, on the lives that they will lead and on the nutrition that they can achieve because we have one planet, one global food system, and if I take too much, it leaves less for others. So it, it's really understanding that it is one closed loop. It is one, uh, one global food system. And, and finally, we have to really take seriously uh, the ecosystem services. I know it sounds, you know, a bit jargonistic, but the concept that, you know, if, if part of the world, if, if a, if a country, a low or middle income developing country decides to put aside a large part of their rainforest that is the lungs of the planet and is integral to stabilising the future of the climate uh, here on planet Earth, they still deserve to be able to uh, live a respectable life. They should still be able to afford to buy food for their family. They should be remunerated for those ecosystem services in the same way that if someone produces food somewhere else, and chops uh, the land, clears the land and produces food uh, where it can be produced most efficiently, uh, you know, they are remunerated for that food. We need to remunerate people uh, for the ecosystem functions that we need to survive as a planet as well. And until we do that, until we see that we are living on one planet with one closed loop system uh, and that by taking too much, we take from others, um, you know, we're not going to get to where we need to be in terms of uh, our global food systems and global diets. Thanks, Sandra. We're just about out of time, and I might give you the last quick question here um, that comes from um, Catherine. And she's asking about the Health Star rating system, which obviously is very important um, to many people in Australia and something that they use to help guide their food choices. Do you think it should be revised with a sustainability component included? Uh, I'd love to. Is the question for me? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think Ali's probably better, better place to <coughs> um, Yeah, look, I, I, think, I think there is, uh, there are some steps that clearly we can take to strengthen the system as it stands at the moment. Um, when, you know, making it mandatory and, and um, making it more comprehensive, uh, it's a great start. And yeah, I think if we can integrate, there are systems around the world, there is research that shows that we can integrate both health and sustainability dimensions to really empower consumers to have better uh, information at the point at the point of consumption, just like we have, we now mandate, you know, that people should uh, understand where food comes from, that the place of origin uh, is is on products. Uh, I think understanding the um, toll that it has, how it's produced, um, the the fact that everyone in the supply chain was treated fairly and respectfully, and uh, that by consuming that product, you're not taking food from people uh, half a planet away. Uh, I think that would be a very good step forward for, for um, you know, for, for 
the Australian policy space. I think it's the right thing to do, and I think most people would probably support it as well. Thank you, Sandro. So it's been a fascinating evening. We've heard a lot about the importance of the food and what we eat and how we grow and develop and, and eat it um, in not just our own personal health, but the health of the planet. We've heard a lot about the things that we as a country, but also that we individually can do um, to help move us towards um, better uh, food, both from a personal and a, and a planetary perspective, um, and the fact that it's really important to start with little steps and we don't have to be perfect straight away. And I think that's a really important message for us individually and as a nation. And Sandro has also reminded us um, that we can sprinkle a little bit of joy across all of this as we um, take advantage of exploring some of the wonderful foods that Damon in particular has highlighted during the conversation tonight. So I hope you've all taken something away um, from this session tonight. I know I certainly have. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to Sandro for, for speaking to us and thanks to Jen, Ali and Damon for their contributions to our fabulous discussion. Um, I'd like to thank you all for, for dialing in. If you'd like to hear about more events, please do subscribe to the UNSW Centre for Ideas web, uh, newsletter. And um, until next time, next time, I wish you all a good night.